Hello, Warriors. How's everyone doing? Alexander, Ren, hello, Arena, Hugo, Sinatra. Everyone doing okay? Hello, LZ. Okay. So yesterday I talked about the S&Ps and a very important pivot. Hey, Dale, it's Blake. Good morning. Yes, buddy. How are you? Hey, hey good. I uh, just want to let you know, I don't see your charts. Oh, there they are. <laughs> okay, buddy. It was me. <laughs> Thanks, Blake. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I was like, uh, I, you know, you know how it is. If you think yeah. you're showing your charts and you're not, and then next thing you know, you're five minutes uh, in and people are like, hey, dude, we don't see your charts. Anyway. Yeah, I've done that a million times. <laughs> hey, we all have. All right. I'll, I'll let you continue on. I'll see you in a few minutes. All right. Thank you, buddy. So uh, this pivot that we had here, I said for the market to stabilize, we had to get back above it. You know, when you look left, you you could see how important it is. Maybe better here. Right. So underneath this pivot, market's vulnerable. Took it out on Friday and look what happened once we close above it. So you know, now I think there's a shot unless we fail right from here to make a run towards uh, 4,300 into uh, next week, perhaps into the end of the month. NASDAQ is uh, close to making a new high. And, you know, the S&Ps could be a failing rally because the NASDAQ's almost there. So here's your three drive. We're not there. We need new highs. I, I think we could go to 14.4. So we'll see what kind of divergence it is. But I just want to do a little coaching here. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of you guys over the years have learned uh, about the three drive. But look at this on the daily. So you have, you know, one, two, and the third is developing here. What you get sometimes on the third drive is actually, this is the third drive and we're setting up a three drive at the on the third drive. So you could get fractals of it and I've seen them occur a lot on the last uh, drive, on the third drive. So uh, we're on the verge of having a non-confirmation in NASDAQ on multiple timeframes, uh, even the daily. So at new highs, we're not printing new highs here. Uh, we were diverging on the four hour, which is different than it was on the first drive. See that? Then you see the second drive and a third drive, uh, depending upon where the RSI closes. Uh, if we get up to 14.4, uh, good possibility that we do not blow out this divergence. We're getting a little bit of, uh, after we had that little pullback in the dollar, it wasn't much. <clears throat> uh, I could see two scenarios, either, you know, this is A and this is B and we're still going to get a C <clears throat> here. Or we could just, to complete this thing, just go up one more time towards 92.90-ish uh, and then have a better correction. And I think that's going to take the um, euro back under 118. 1760 is going to be a point where I think there could be um, a decent bounce. So it's not quite this low. This is 1680, but around this uh, 1760 level, a uh, lot of support there and cable giving it up to Aussie fading as well. So you know, one day relief rally, maybe Aussie has one more leg, A, B, C. And, you know, what's going to be interesting is uh, the, I think the dollar's bottom for a while before we get to 95. And we had a little dollar relief with the dollar uh, softening yesterday. It's going to be interesting to see we need the dollar to be keep going in a wave two or B to accommodate new highs in the S&P. So today's a pretty important day. Um, a great trade on the long side in Euro-Aussie, Blake. Um, I, 
uh, you really rolled that like uh, you know champion. You, uh, you know, I, Dale, I've been sitting in that thing literally for a month, uh, maybe even longer. Actually, like yeah, I think five weeks. Um, I, I'm playing it as you, you can see your blue line that you have drawn. Oh yeah, uh, let me make sure that's correct. Um, is that a four hour? That's a four hour. So that's no, hour. I'm, I'm, I've got a I've got a daily chart where I'm. It, it's a triangle breakout while it's above 157. It's just been okay. It, it's it's been slow going. Look but, what it's tagging here. Yeah, yeah, it's sitting right under the 200 day. You know the yeah. thing about this, and and what will put us well over the 200 day moving average and in rally mode for this particular pair, is just seeing some, you know, risk aversion. And I mean, we're back above 4200 today. I mean, we're at 4230 right now. Yeah. The SP. I mean, we're we're within what? I mean, what is that? A percent of uh, all time yeah. highs. So it's like. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to see the the Euro Aussie press higher while we're that close to all time highs. But at the same time, we're near all time highs, and we're just sitting under the two hundred day moving average. If the, if the equity markets see a a five percent correction, that Euro Aussie is going to be trading at you know probably a, a, like five percent higher, and that's okay. a big move for this pair. So yeah. Yeah, we get through there, uh, this area here. Yeah, you could probably count it uh, maybe 164 if we get yeah, through. Yeah, I would, um, you know, just this, just the triangle alone, um, just eyeballing it here. I mean, the, 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 the triangle alone really points us to like 162. I mean, we could, we could, we could go a lot higher. This is one of those currency, the, the Euro crosses and the Sterling crosses. Uh, against commodity currencies those are currencies that can really move aggressively if there's some sort risk of off. risk off yeah they're 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 100 candidates for it and you it's a great observation dale that you're pointing yeah. out i mean we're just sitting under the 200 day moving average you know maybe there's one more break in the next week or so i noticed that uh, i think greg is bearish uh, this pair I looked at, uh, I checked it out. Um, I think he's bearish this pair, but that was a great trade. See, so it took a long time. You didn't get the kind of windfall, but it was still a very nice and successful trade. Um, you know, I think that we have to, I don't know if Canada is going to accommodate people that miss this move, Blake. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'd prefer to be able to buy it at 22, but uh, I don't know if it's going to, you know, give you know, on such a to do that as 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 Elliott Wave people would say, that's an impulsive move, right? You know, yeah. when you get an impulsive move like that, it's really hard to get pullbacks. Speaking of which, yeah. Dale, I got I got to take over the screen for a second. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but no, it's um, no, it's all right. Thing I want to point out is um, Bitcoin's actually really on the move. Oh, here. is it breaking down now? Yeah, it is, and. Um, so, sorry, I, I got I got to talk about it because it is it, it started breaking down just about a, three or four minutes ago, and um, I and hope it, you told your son. Oh, you know it's funny. You know, Did Steve you wanted to <laughs> make sure he sent me an overnight message and uh, and uh, and 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 see how my family was feeling about Dogecoin. Oh yeah, um, I saw that. Twenty you, you, you guys, you guys know this, and and if you're a, a if you're an, a daily listener of the Face Webinar. You know, when my 14 year old and 16 year old kids start trading Dogecoin in our um, Robinhood accounts, uh, or not not Robinhood, well, Robinhood, they trade Bitcoin. Um, uh, they buy Dogecoin and um, yeah. whatever account that my wife set up for them. Um, that was the top. I mean, it was literally the top. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, but, uh, I, just this weekend, my son's like, uh, my son's like, uh, Ethereum's at 20, 22, yeah. 2,300. He goes, every time it gets down here, it goes back to 3000. I'm like, I'm like, Roman, it's going a lot lower. I'm like, it's, it's breaking through this, you know, triangle support. This is on Saturday, um, or right here. And, uh, and I'm like, don't, you know, and they're going to do whatever they want to do. Right. Sure. Yeah. So he, he, he was, uh, he was laying in bed, uh, late yesterday uh, morning, um, uh, because he's a teenager. <laughs> I, uh, 
but yeah. you know, I, I, I said, Hey, what's wrong? And he's like, he's like, I, I, I keep losing money buying Ethereum. I'm like, why are you, <laughs> I'm like, well, they're not going to listen to me because yeah. he's 14 and I'm his dad. So, um, but you know, I just want to <laughs> tell him out. to transit, tell him to transfer his account. I said, you won't worry, be his broker worry. anymore. These, these losses are just transitory, son. Um, yeah. <laughs> we are below the 200 day moving average in Ethereum and, uh, we are, we're, um, you know, looking to break this 1750, 1720 level. Now the Ethereum move points to, you know, a lot lower to 300. Now I, whether or not we get there is, you know, I mean, we could, I'm not, I, I can't, I can't, I can't not see what I see. I mean, it is just, it is what it is. I mean, and, and I tweeted about Bitcoin yesterday and the flag pattern points to, you know, 12,000. Um, I know a lot of people that are going to buy it at 20. And, and yeah. believe me, I, I think that we're going to get a tactical bounce there. So if, if, you know, there's going to be so many buyers in at 20, 20,000, we're, we're probably going to get a bounce. I just, I would assume that we move even lower than that. Remember, there's a lot of institutional money in cryptos now and they lose money too. Don't, you know, I, I think a lot of people have this false sense of security, like, oh, um, you know, uh, institutions are buying Bitcoin. So it's, it's not going to go to zero. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, institutional uh, money bought, you know, broadcast.com too. So what, you know. Blake, yeah. so, sorry to interrupt. You read the headline, Melvin Capital reveals that they had a Dogecoin position, potential losses unknown. This was early today. Oh, no, I was asleep. Yeah. So I, didn't, I missed that one. So yeah, so there you go. It's not just, you know, uh, average Joe. It's the, the big boys as well. Yeah, of course. And, you know, and, and look. Um, yeah. Big people lose money. People, institutions lose money all the time. And it's, I, I, I mean, we have to go back to the original. You know, How about long-term capital with all the Nobel laureate mathematicians that oh, the yeah. Fed have I mean, to bail you know, out? Yeah. And you, 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 you um, um, what's his name that built the Phoenician that taught his son how to trade uh, um, with uh, long-term capital Um God dang it. I can't remember. It's so early in the morning here, as you guys know. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. It's anyway, not that. You're just old. Uh, and I'm old. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Charles <laughs> Keating. Charles Keating. Yeah. I, 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 I taught Charles Keating's the third, uh, his third son, or his second son, the swimmer, how to trade. Anyway, that was back in 1996. Regardless, or 1998, excuse me. Um, regardless, you know, what I'm trying to point out here, though, is is we are seeing what we see and that people do lose money and institutions do lose money and they make bad decisions as well. And and we have like I said, we have to go back to our our original discussion. And, you know, China's coming down on these. On yeah, these hard. Miners. They are. And you have to imagine governments are going to come after th this crypto. The crypto space is a big risk to control control right yeah i mean it is so if you think our governments are going to idly stand by and just let it happen i i would strongly disagree with you and blake i'm yeah. really sorry to interrupt again have a look at the chart of bitcoin and ethereum where is the top which day is the peak uh when that? my son said uh started trading what what Four, day is 14th that? of april right Yes, 14th of April. You know what happened on that day? Um, Coinbase IPO'd. Oh, yeah. Very, very good point. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, it's the it's the usual event that marks it up, right? I uh, mean, it's, yeah. it's the epitome of the... And, and, you know, it's not a magical thing that these things happen. It's just because, let's say that you are out of this game. You, you are, like, full of FOMO. You are fully frustrated that you haven't participated. And then Coinbase IPO is happening, and whoever is uh, wants to get involved is piling in to take advantage to preempt uh, this event. And then there's nobody left to buy because everybody that wanted to buy ha have already bought. It's as simple as that. 
Yeah, and and that that's correct. I mean, retail's in. Retail's always last to be in, and and that's that's, you know, I, I'm I'm going to go back to a conversation that we had probably a year ago, and I you know, and I just want to reiterate the, you know, it used to be back back in the day, and this would be, um, you know, back in let's just say roughly 2000 and and before that. So when Dale and I you know traded, uh, we, it was before machines and algorithms and blah 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 and and really the information age really before the internet and and stelios this goes back into your time frame as well you know we used to say you know the the money i mean the market's peak when when mom and pop get in when you know and that that's by the time your mom and dad or your grandma and grandpa knew that it was time to be buying or selling the stock market that was the top or the bottom, always. Yeah. And it, it, the 24th century was. mom and pop is 14-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 16-year-olds. It or or the millennials, or you know, the the it's just retail. You know, it's it's it retail is gonna be the last to know will be the 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 not in the know. So people that you know that are trading that really shouldn't be trading in all actuality, um, that they're gonna mark the top. And so the, 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 the mom and pops of today is completely different. It's not, you know, it's not, you know, you're, you're, it's not the Japanese, um, you know, stay at home mom, um, you know, like when we were oh, trading yeah. yen in 2000, uh, what, what, what would we call her? Miss, um, Mrs. Watanabe. Watanabe. Yeah. Watanabe. Yeah. So they, I mean, that's, that's, it's not like the 2000, you know, eight, 2009 uh, situation in Japan. It is completely different now. And so, so the thing is, is you are getting retail, as Steve pointed out, Coinbase is, you know, yeah, it's their IPO, all the retail traders. Or, uh, I mean, look, I open a Coinbase account. I have a Coinbase account. So, you know, it's like, oh, you know, okay, you know, it's a publicly traded company. Now, now you got the retail going, hey, there, there's a publicly traded company that's trading, uh, 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 crypto, I can, I can open an account there and then you got everybody in. Right. And so now the markets are really coming undone and look, I don't, I don't think we've even really started. I think that, uh, this move could really continue and, you know, Bitcoin below 30,000 might kick it off. And, um, I, like I said, a lot of people are going to be buying at 20,000 targets go down all the way down to 12. Um, and, you know, and Blake- I, I'd targeted down here at, this is a whole support zone. Previous high in June of 2019 come in, came in around 13,000. This whole area is going to be ripe for a bounce, but you know we could over we could overshoot it. I'm Blake, sorry. Steve, uh, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. As I said yesterday, as exactly the peak of enthusiasm manifesting in the um, uh, Coinbase IPO marked the top. I, I really strongly believe that before we find the bottom, MicroStrategy has to blow up. Oh, yeah, I, of course. Yeah, I think that can be the bottom. You know what I mean? The, the, they're the poster child of that. And, you know, the, the sad thing is, is like you, uh, you know, you look at like, you know, Tesla and, you know, Tesla as, as cool of cars as they make. And, you know, I mean, where I live, everybody, Tesla is about as common as a Honda Civic. Uh, where I live right now um, in North Scottsdale, it's, you know, the, the, the company's probably going to be shunned. Um, you know, it, 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 it will be. I mean, you got a lot of disdain for Elon Musk and things that he's done, and you know, and, and, and uh, anyway. Um, but you got to see companies like that are really going to be put through the ringer, in my opinion. A couple other things I want to point out. I, I actually had my um, uh, real, really good friend who's a... Uh, he does commercial real estate development in Texas. He, he called me up yesterday. He's like, you know, Hey, what do I buy? He's like, do I buy some gold? And I'm like, well, you know, in this environment, I don't think gold's a bad place to have some of your money. Uh, especially if, if, if you, if you talk about the antithesis of, uh, of Bitcoin, which might be actually gold, um, you might have a lot of people come back into gold, but I, I do think that the dollar is going to outperform here. Um, and, and, you know, so gold, I think will be fairly well supported. I, I don't think gold goes t- deviates too far from where we're at, whether it's at 1600 or, you know, 2000, I, I think that this would be a, a longer term trading range for, for gold. So, you know, 
pick your poison here on, you know, would you rather be in this or would you rather be in the dollar? I think that you're going to have a lot of the safe haven flows that come into the dollar. Now, let's just point out that the dollar has acted really well um, with equities at current levels. I mean, you got the S&P, which is, at, you know, again, we're within what a half percent of, of all time highs and the dollar index is, uh, you know, looks really strong. And I will say any move above uh, 9280 here in the dollar index, remember we're getting yeah. nice and comfortable above the 200 day moving average. We could be trading in the mid nineties because this is not what, this is the, would be the exact opposite of the 2021 trade of the year for every bank on wall street hands down, wasn't one thinking anything else of 2021. Euro's going to trade at 140. Dollar's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Well, guess what? We're halfway into 2021. You throw a little pepper and a little risk aversion. Yeah, the Euro's going to be trading at 113 and uh, we'll have the dollar index back at 96. So, and which will be the exact opposite of what every bank said in December of 2020. You know, yeah. so I, I just need to throw that out there. So, Steve and Stelios, what, what say you guys uh, today? And by the way, we do have Powell speaking today. Um, and oh, you not know, again. He, well, yeah, he's probably going <sighs> to reiterate things that he said. Um, the you know things that he said last week post FOMC. I don't think he's going to deviate from that script too much. But you have to also keep in mind he's had a lot of his uh, his Fed uh, governors out calming the markets the last. 24 hours. I mean, you, you think about all the Fed speeches that we just got yesterday, you know, they're all out there, you know, dubbing it out, you know, like, oh, whoa, 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 you know, markets got a little carried away at the end of last week, you know, yeah, the S&P, you know, sold off, like, holy crap. Well, you know, we had every Fed governor march in parade style, talking about how dovish they are, rates don't need to go higher. And, you know, obviously, the market, you know, liked what it heard but you you know that that is purely a a a move from the the fed chairman saying hey you know rewrite your speech a little bit for next week and let's make sure that we let's let's make sure we dovish out a little bit okay and then you know obviously stop yeah it. because the previous fomc uh meeting was so hawkish i mean so hawkish <laughs> not <laughs> but you know the the fact of the matter is the market you know responded yeah the fomc statement of, was like incrementally they, they, less dovish and uh, because i i listened post event the to the powell q and a i mean powell couldn't have been more dovish than that uh, it's, it's explicit he explicitly said that they haven't even be began discussing when they're going to be discussing hiking rates I mean, what else can he say? I know, and but the thing is, is it's, in, it's recent inflation expectations, and 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 it's, and it's the picture he painted about jobs. I mean, you know, he he is. I, I thought he was way more hawkish on on the jobs um, uh, employment picture than he should have been or could have been, and he was, you know. So th that's those are the small little details that 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 everybody's queuing off of, and the market did. But once again, we had a bit of a recovery. Um, but man, I, I gotta, I gotta point out some of these, you know, risk off type of currencies. Look at the emerging market currencies guys. Uh, now if you're a Forex analytics subscriber, uh, and you listen to the daily roundup, or even if you're not, and you listen to the daily roundup a day after the fact, because we do publish those uh, on the YouTube channel every day, it's just, you, you'll get a, a, a day late. Okay. I want to point out this is the um, U.S. dollar Mexican peso. This is a Wyckoff um, setup, um, and you know this is really. I'll just point this out really quick. Uh, I want to show you a couple things here. So show you where we are in the cycle, right? Um, you know we had the. Um, this is the low volume uh, sell off right here. This is, you know, the consolidation right here. Okay. This also matched these lows, um, which gave us a false breakdown too, on top of everything that you're seeing here. So now we are, we have already completed this part. Uh, we are 
they call it in this example, jump the creek, but we are, you know, on our way to doing this. Um, so once you get to keep that in mind, now, the reason why I point this out is because, you know, this is, um, um, this is one of those situations where you have to pay attention to what's happening with, um, with emerging market currencies, because emerging market currencies, when they start weakening like this, that's a, that's a signal that we might get some risk off. Then on top of it, you take other, trying to get over to my mouse again, you know, you take these, these uh, commodity type of currencies like, uh, you know, the dollar Canadian, you know, we're just consolidating gains. Uh, the Aussies consolidating losses and the Aussie, by the way, does point to 72 cents. And you see copper came under some pressure this morning from some Chinese headlines. Look, you know, these commodity currencies, you know, if they start breaking down, emerging market currencies start breaking down. Next thing you know, it's, it's, it's usually um, met with uh, some risk aversion. So just keep, keep those little things in mind. Stelius, so, you've been kind of quiet. What, what do you got to say other than... Um Coinbase went public, and that was the top. <laughs> <laughs> I think the um, I think the Fed and Jay Powell they have a very difficult job to do because what they do want is they want to slowly reduce their bond purchases and you know dare I say it, rate, hike rates as well. But eventually, without, right? But without without markets actually um, crashing, so that's what they're trying to do. They go, you know, tell us, oh, you know, we're going to start thinking about doing it. But hey, don't but, panic. But he, he made a good point, though, you know, during his his presser. And he's like, look, you know, we sur we we survived through covid because we had our we had the ability to act where Europe didn't. And he's like, you know, we have to come off the zero bound and we have to come out, come out of that so we can react in the next crisis, because there will be one. He made that very clear during his uh, his press. He, he did, and they can react. Even if rates are at zero, they can still buy more and more of everything. And that, in the short term, will probably calm markets, just like it did in uh, with COVID. But in the medium term, what does it do? You know, the Fed's balance sheet is ballooning. Uh, asset price inflation, we're seeing it everywhere. So, yeah. you know, unless they actually reduce uh, the bond purchases to zero, you know, or close to, and, um, you know, do something a little bit more drastic. Uh, I think anything they do is going to be very- Bitcoin's short. below 30,000, guys. Oh, just let you know. We're, I mean, it's, it's a complete- Yeah, yeah it's and, going now. It's, guys, this is going to usher in. You have to imagine when you have institutional selling, like, uh, you know, like, let's just, let's just say it's um, Melvin Capital. I'm just going to use that name because uh, Stella, she pointed it out. Mel Melvin Capital, you know, they're they're down. Um, you know, they they got they have a margin call because they're getting absolutely smashed in Dogecoin. Well, then they they have to turn around and liquidate some other assets because you know because they have to shore up some of their you know some some capital um, because of their losses. Then it turns into you, you get the snowball effect. Basically, what happens, right? And that's why you know a move lower in cryptocurrencies has always worried me, especially as of late because institutional money is now involved. And when institutional money is now involved, now you have the uh, you know genetic makeup that could really create some sort of panic selling in other asset classes, not just Bitcoin. People go, oh, well, it's just going to be isolated to crypto. It has to this point. But at what point does it really start to press margin levels and risk management levels on an institutional level to where they have to start liquidating other assets? What do you think, Stell? You, you've been in you, you, you work for Barclays on an institutional level, trading bonds for so many years. So what do you think? Um, it's interest rates, folks, for Barclays and Merrill. But yeah, same thing. Um, whatever. It, it, will, it will depend on... You, you, you uh, traded you know, checkers will... for, you know, you traded Pokemon <laughs> over at the, uh, it, the corner stop. <laughs> it will depend on, depend on leverage, on the risk profile. I mean, we don't know it. But uh, I, think, I think the one thing that we do know, like uh, Steve mentioned and we've talked about it before, is micro strategy. We know 26,000 is their average. And they've been buying and buying and, and Guys, borrowing and just... buying more. So. <laughs> Just imagine the amazing vicious circle. The moment we hit 26,000, their debt is going to implode. I mean, who's going to want to buy that debt, right, from, from other people's hands? Nobody. And then the pressure begins. They won't have the ability to, to borrow anymore to support the price. 
and the market is going to be fixated and looking at them, how much room do they have uh, to the downside before uh, they have right. to start liquidating? All right, Doomer, Gloomer, Boomer. Uh, we We're not go. that far away from that, bro. Doomer, <laughs> literally, Doomer, with how much Bitcoin is moving, okay, we can literally the be sailor, there tomorrow. Man. Okay, I buy boomer. all the crypto I can. <laughs> Yeah, but he won't be able to buy anymore. That's hey, the point. Look, um, Dale's got his uh, his uh, Dale's got his um, his uh, his. He better his, eat uh, his spinach. Yeah, Michael yeah. Saylor, huh? Dale's got his interview coming up. Hey, I just yeah, want to say, guys, thank you guys for tuning in today. Remember, visit our our our, our sponsors, Pepperstone Securities, one of the largest FX brokers in the world. If you want to learn how to be part of the Forex Analytics community uh, for free. Open an account if you're outside of the U.S. or Canada. Open a Pepperstone account. You can get Forex Analytics for up to four months free. Uh, if you live in the U.S. and Canada and you're not getting cashback rebates, um, open your account here or, uh, or excuse me. Well, you can do that too. But um, contact Forest Park and FX. We've been working with them for years, so traders in the U.S. and Canada can get cashback rebates on their FX trades. So. Um, they're they're a huge resource. Um, you know, obviously we do interviews with them from time to time. Justin had a great interview. What three weeks ago? That was awesome. Um, so Dale, uh, have a yeah. great interview. Steve Stelios, okay. uh, thanks for joining us. As always, see you I'm going to pass it over minutes. to you. Thanks. Yep, thanks. we'll see you guys in 45 okay. minutes for the okay. Forex Analytics Morning Edge webinar for Forex Analytics. Subscribers. Good hunting today, buddy. Thanks, guys. Hi, Kevin. Welcome back. I'm glad we got our time straight. Asking you to unmute my trading warrior brother. It seems to be unmuted, uh, Dale. Okay. Hello, so Kevin. Now. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's not always easy across continents, is it? But there you go. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, uh, thank you very much for taking time out today to be with us. Uh, appreciate it, uh, everyone. Uh, Kevin works with uh, Patrick Kareem, and uh, uh, they put together some real nice technical work. So uh, picture speaks a thousand words. Kevin, if you want to share the screen, it's a green button there. Yeah, I've uh, got that, I think. I'll just... Uh... And, and, you know, uh, Kevin's uh, profession is a meteorologist and you know before we get to some of the markets um these weather patterns um do you believe that we've moved into this um dry cold uh you know uh, to be an ultimate contrarian everyone's talking about global warming uh you know i've interviewed some people that really believe that uh the opposite might be about to happen uh, that we could have another mini ice age like we had a few centuries ago um, because of solar, the lack of solar activity, and um, uh, you know, and also bear markets uh, from climatologists that I've uh, read or took into account what the sun did um, do not happen during warm and wet. Uh, type of situations, but happen more in cold and dry situations. Uh, do you see that as a global trend? Or are you in the global warming camp uh, or neither? <laughs> that's a, that's a, a very difficult question to answer, Dale. Yeah, uh, there's when's a, there's a, a, of, when's a there's mini a lot, ice age? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in there, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm, I, I treat my meteorology the same way I treat my chart trading and just let the evidence um, right. And the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fall into place, and we can see um, quite clearly what's actually ha happening at the moment. You know, we can measure sea level rise, and we can measure the the mass okay. of ice at the North Pole and the South Pole. So yeah. we can uh, we can we can monitor all that kind of stuff. So I mean, my my view is that for whatever reason, you know, people have different views and opinions, but for whatever reason, the sea level is measurably rising by about five millimeters per year, and that's coming from melting ice. Um, again, for whatever reason, okay. um, some okay. might, you know. So it's the same so with the markets, you know. Just so. go ahead and uh, share your screen, though. Kevin, yeah. You haven't done okay. That. I'm just uh, attempting to share the screen. I hit the share screen button, but uh, I'm guessing you can't okay. see that at the moment yet. All right. So uh, you you still think you know the rise of uh, sea levels that you know we're in for this melt, and uh, I know it's been awfully 
hot here on the west coast of uh, we're we're in a severe drought out west in the U.S. Yeah, that's that's right. Well, much of the northern hemisphere is suffering from uh, above average temperatures, and we've got heat waves going on across much of continental Europe at the moment that are um, breaking records. And I saw that uh, across in the states, I think it was across in Death Valley, having some incredibly high temperatures even by by their standards. So. Um, Okay. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm hoping you can see the screen now. Is that visible? I can. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> talking I... about long-term trends and uh, climate yeah. and, and weather, we've got a very long-term chart here for silver. And, yeah. So uh... <laughs> yeah, that's a nice long-term chart. I just want to ask you, and then I'll stop interrupting you for a while. <laughs> does, uh, the action that we saw after the Fed last week. Um, change anything in the longer term view would uh, or would we have to take out say twenty dollars to uh, kind of delay this parabolic move to the upside and what a what great chart work you do Kevin <laughs> nice yeah. stuff good it's, stuff it's always good to put things in context um, with with a big picture isn't it so yeah, it helps yeah. you, it helps you to realize that what the Fed might say from one meeting to the next is a lot of the time it's background noise because the Fed are you know, they're, they're trying to um, follow a narrative. They're trying to um, guide the markets. They're trying to um, perhaps give us the impression that everything is, you know, doing great when everything really isn't doing great. Um, and it's not the Fed's job to tell us when, um, you know, terrible things are likely to happen. It's the Fed's job to calm the markets and to um, to try and help um, mitigate that. So you wouldn't expect the Fed to um, to be able to actually, you know, admit what is likely to happen uh, looking at these mm -hmm. charts um it would cause market panic and all sorts of sorts of chaos no doubt so yeah in terms of what you know what the fed said last week um um you know to me it wasn't what they said it was how severe the reaction was from it, just jawboning which kind of tells me uh there were a lot of weak hands and uh, uh pretty fragile markets mm -hmm. that would uh or leaning really the wrong uh the wrong way many that mm -hmm. we'd have that type of you know two dollar mm -hmm. break in silver mm -hmm. and almost a hundred bucks in gold um yeah um well yeah. which is why i think it's why the technical analysis really helps us because from a technical chart perspective it was all routine action really um there was nothing in there that was um, unusual or a problem or um that broke any of the charts so um okay. looking at looking at silver here over a long period of time of course you know it's um it's very clear that we can see uh, a drop down to the uh, second supporting arc is is um perfectly acceptable that would be in the right. sort of 18 to 20 dollar region if we came down retested the edge of the the second arc there um, but the general trend um, over the next several years is is clearly in, a, in an upwards direction of in the process of sharing that chart. It's just slightly knocked the lines out of place. You might notice one or two of the um, the, the bits where the line goes outside of the second arc. That's just uh, because it's slightly distorted it. But um, yeah, the target is clear. Um, okay. It's hundred dollars plus in the mid to late 2020s. Um, and uh, so from some that point of view um it's, it's all routine price action um i could uh, show you the um just uh, share this chart with you so looking at it in a little bit more detail this is um uh, gold's launch attempt as i've been been calling it and um you can see here that the the arc which has guided us all the way from 2011 all the way through the correction it's been tested once twice three times four five six seven eight nine been tested on multiple occasions and has withstood the test Perfect breakout and back test, typical yeah. um, chart action where you get break break up through a, a downtrend line, bounced off the arc above the moving average, twelve month moving average, and we've been um, correcting obviously since last summer, but we corrected back to a very significant point there, right on the edge of the arc. We took off, broke out of the pennant, um, and have come back down to retest the arc. So, um, not at all unusual to see a retest after a breakout like that. Um, it's, uh, it's bouncing off the, the arc at the moment. So we've got some very what clear... What price lines. level is that? About 17.40 on the arc? The edge of the arc at the moment is around about 17.40, 17.45, yeah. that, kind of, that kind of number. Okay, um, and if we take that out? If we take that out, then the 15.60 to 18.30 zone of um, support, if you look across to the left-hand side of the arc there, you can see that price oscillated between 
15, 16, 18, 30 for a couple of years. Oh, on then, the left hand side. On the left hand side there, yeah, okay. around about 2011 yeah. to 2013. Yeah. So um, from a chart uh, uh, symmetry perspective and also a support perspective, you would um, perhaps you know expect to see that if that was to be taken out, you'd see us oscillating for a couple of years between 15, 16, 18, 30 before the upside move after the eight year cycle low, which of course is coming up in either late 2023 or sometime in 2024. You can't pin these lows down precisely, of course, but okay. every eight years, the uh, precious metals markets take a, take a dive a bit like they did in 2008 and 2016. Okay. So one of our attendees is saying that we could get a, this could form the cup of a, uh, the handle of a cup and handle if we started trading in that zone. Yeah, down. it's a classic, uh, classic chart formation, of course, and the yeah. handle doesn't always form. It sometimes does, it sometimes doesn't, but you can get a messy handle forming or a very textbook handle. Um, with the low being in 2023 or 2024, it would be a pretty large and extended handle for, for this type of cup, but um, it wouldn't be unusual at all. Um, but it all hangs on just how transitory um, in inverted commas, the um, the inflation is uh, that we're that we're yeah. seeing at the moment. So inflation, as you know, has picked up to from four point two to I think it's five point five percent in the United States now. Um, yeah. So five percent yeah. inflation is um, perhaps a little bit of a problem when you're looking at um, um, rates on the ten year yield and the twenty year yield. You know, significantly um, below that, and real rates, of course, um, dropping in unison. Um, so. Um, I can show you a, a yield chart. Um, I just have to keep uh, slightly minimising the screen here because I've got a control bar at the top, which is quite annoying. Um, there must be a way of taking that out of the way, but um, just bear with me a moment. I'll just... Yeah, I'm, interested. I'm interested in everything you have to show. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the treasury we... yields. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so this is yep. this is the yield on the thirty-year note. So it's the longer end of the, the curve, the, um, the the longer dated uh, right. debt. I suppose relates to things like mortgages and that kind of thing um, that uh, are related to U.S. debt. But you can see quite clearly how um, over is this a ten-year ten-year yield? This is this or one 30? here. Is, this one here is a thirty. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's the long, it's the longer, the longer duration debt. Okay. Um, so what you can see is since uh, two thousand eleven, we've uh, been building out um, a kind of a symmetrical triangle, I guess you'd call it, with uh, the numbers, the, the numbers in the blue boxes showing the uh, U.S. Um, debt, um, not unfunded liabilities and all the rest of it, just the straightforward, um, outstanding uh, U.S. debt mountain, which has quite steadily climbed by one or two trillion every few years, um, and then we've got a problem. We've got a problem because the chart's broken down, but we've got a problem because um, the debt has jumped in the space of um, a, a time period where you'd normally expect the, the, the debt burden to increase by one or two trillion. It's, a, it's increased yeah. by, by three times that, four times that. So uh, huge um, amounts of debt being added as a result of the um, COVID pandemic, of course. Um, so why does that matter? Well, it matters because um, when you look at the 10-year um, note, this is a 10-year note here. I'll just uh, minimise the pain on the right so you can see it better. So this is the shorter duration, perhaps more important um, yeah. um, debt, uh, US government debt that is sold around the world. Um, so investors will buy uh, the 10 year uh, note and this is the, uh, the rate of return they'll get from it. So going back to the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, big problem, very high inflation. Um, high um, interest on the 10-year note was a, a becoming to be you know, yeah. an incredible problem. So Paul Volcker came yeah. along, whacked up uh, interest rates, and that knocked it. Were off. you in the business then, or is that a history lesson? That's a history lesson. <laughs> I was. Uh, right, I was don't, rub, I was don't, don't rub it in. <laughs> I was born in '69, so I'm a. Uh, Oh, bit. the summer of love. Summer now of I know love, how yeah. that happened. Okay. <laughs> I think my parents uh, might have the answer to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure they loved each other. <laughs> uh, so ever since then, of course, we've been getting used to a, a rate of ever decreasing uh, interest um, and, uh, yeah, of course, atten attending sort of decreasing um, rates on the on the 10-year note. So that's all fine. But from a technical chart perspective, this is a, a descending um, wedge 
it's slightly oh, narrower at the base than it yeah. is at the top. Yeah. Um, and from a technical chart perspective, uh, descending uh, narrowing wedges are, are a bullish pattern. Right. So it's wanting to break up the natural forces of chart, chart action, the natural forces of physics, if you like, are, are wanting to break it out. You can see that happened back in uh, 2018. Yeah. And it wasn't allowed to continue for fairly obvious reasons. I think uh, with um, with with yields of three point three five percent on the amount of debt that was built up at that stage, it was clearly too much to, to handle. And um, uh, the, the government stepped in, the Fed stepped in, bond uh, buying, and um, managed to get the bond yields back down to um, the Treasury note yields back down to below. Uh, sort of two percent, which is manageable. It, I'm not an economist, and I can't um, speak with authority about exactly what number is manageable and what isn't. But looking at the chart, it appears to me that at the time, somewhere just above three percent was a problem. Um, now, factor in the fact that we've doubled our debt since then, um, and tripled so, the rates. And, yeah, so 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 there's going to be a, an issue here because we've built out a bullish uh, flag. It's a bull flag that's just uh, formed here. Yeah. Uh, if I zoom into the weekly chart, you'll be able to see that. Um, and so the bull flag um, is a classic chart pattern which yeah. breaks to the upside. Um, so what's going to happen here? Um, is is are the forces of nature going to be allowed to to take over and and the uh, the yields rise? And if they do rise to their natural target of somewhere around three three and a half percent, can the U.S. economy deal with that? Uh, I don't think it can. Um, I, I think the ability has has fallen since 2018 for for, for interest rates to rise much above above about two percent, um, and probably a little bit below two percent. In fact, if you look at um, um, what's been going on with the real yields, you'll notice that the, although the the yield has risen a little, the real yield hasn't, um, uh, and the real yield has um, continued to. Um, to, to sort of stay roughly where it is or, or even fall a little. So that's, of course, as a result of inflation, background inflation at 5%, don't forget. Um, so um, it, it's a problem. Um, and so. And you think we could have rising yields and rising gold? Well, that's what I was about to move on to, because okay. if you look at, look at the 1970s, of course, and yeah. going back to that history lesson, I think, I think we've, we've become accustomed to the idea that rising yields bad for gold um but it reaches a point a fundamental point where rising yields and i think i think it's a point of recognition you know with investors and traders uh, around the world is that when there's a difference between rising yields um that aren't a problem and rising yields that are an issue and and that that has to do with the mathematics of the ability of the to service you know, debt to service the debt exactly yeah and, and that's yeah. the problem we have now so in a nutshell, if if um, if the yields rise, you know, gold and silver, and, and the commodities generally will will do well because of the problem that's created by that. Um, and yes. if yield, yield curve control is enacted, which is probably going to be necessary, um, then the real yield will fall away precipitously, and that's like throwing gasoline on the fire. Um, at that point, it doesn't matter what the U.S. dollar does; the U.S. dollar can rise and uh, if yields are dropping like a rock then gold will um, perform very well indeed um, but if the dollar uh, does turn down uh, and i've got a dollar chart here as well somewhere here we go yeah i'm, I'm looking for a rally back to 95 uh, you you okay so we have an upside down arc here yeah so okay you have it at 93 Dixon. so we have yeah so we, we have a, a topping pattern here one two three touches and down yeah we have this um, consolidation pattern ahead of it. And we've had a consolidation pattern here, topping pattern here, one, two, three, and down. Um, so, so far, the arc, um, a bit like um, you know the, the other arcs that I've, I've been following, has held very well. Uh, the upper limit of this arc is somewhere around about 93. It can spike okay. higher, like it did at point three here. It spiked up. So oh, yeah. if, um, if we have other factors at play, we could see it move yeah. up to 94, 95. But uh, it's the monthly close that matters. So it, it could spike up in uh, July, um, but it's the monthly close that's, that's going to matter. Um, my targets are lower um, until or unless the arc proves to um, to not be working anymore. Um, so so that's the technical okay. chart analysis as I 
Say it's on the you do anything list. with <clears throat> um, stock indices, Kevin? Yeah, so um, I've had a little look at the SPX uh, recently. I can just um, bring that chart up for you, and hopefully it'll have remembered um, remember the chart that I did. So um, let me just adjust the chart so that it fits the lines I've drawn. Okay, so um, another very interesting point for the for the S and P uh, yeah. for the SPX okay. we're right at the right at the limit there. So. Um, if we're seeing some kind of mania period, stock market blow off, then it wouldn't be at all uncommon to see um, a false breakout, as people sometimes call it, or a um, throwover. A throwover, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a bearish rising wedge, right? Just like the one that we saw in Bitcoin um, several yeah. weeks ago. And bearish rising wedges, um, you know, nearly all, not always, but nearly always, resolve to the downside. Um, the odds favour, like, like back here in 2009, um, you know, we dropped out of that um, bearish rising wedge. Um, so there are a couple of targets if uh, if we do drop down and uh, if we fail to break above approximately 44, 43, 4400, um, then the targets are somewhere 3300 or slightly above, depending on the timing. And then the lower bound target is uh, somewhere near around 3000. Okay, um, that's my target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, a throw over top, 3, throw over top is possible, but uh, just watch that that sort of upper upper level there. And the same can be said for the other equity markets as, as well, of course. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, one of our attendees would uh, is making a request to see your U.S. dollar chart again. Yeah, sure. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> All landed. <laughs> Kevin is, uh, you know. Great guy. How's the, how's the, how do you like working with Patrick? Uh, he's, he's great. He really get really gets my uh, my mind ticking. I, okay. I, have to, I have to start recording some of our conversations because he's yeah. um, he's a great one for going down rabbit holes and looking at things okay. from a completely different point of view. <laughs> Were you guys surprised at all by you know uh, the negative action in crypto? Do you guys cover uh, yes, of course, crypto. I haven't haven't mentioned that, have I? Yeah. So yeah. the the uh, the bear. There's your dollar chart, uh, yeah. Paul. Take there's a picture. The, there's the dollar chart. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's uh, going back to um, the nineteen late nineteen eighties. In fact, over there it's the nineteen seventies, isn't it? But you can't you okay. can't really go back too much further, of course, because you start getting to the whole. Period where Bretton Woods. You know, Woods, so it messes things yeah, up yeah. somewhat. Um, yeah, yeah. But you, so you have to base your, your charting on the evidence that we've got so far. And uh, of course, the dollar. Uh, what I haven't got marked on here, of course, is the U.S. dollar cycle. Um, if I bring up my um, another dollar, I think it's out. down for another couple of years. Mm-hmm. Your 2023 uh, number you mentioned the year. I think 2023 for something. Was Anything. at um, uh, oh, that's a gold cycle for a peak in gold. I think you said. Yeah, that's right. So the, the dollar cycle, the eight year is, cycle, the eight year cycle low in gold is uh, around about twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four. So this is completing the picture for the U.S. dollar cycle. Uh, this chart here shows peak, base, peak, base, peak, and then the base because the reason we're expecting it to. To reach a low point is the, um, <clears throat> the US dollar cycle, uh, approximately 15 years, which bottoms out somewhere around about, uh, well, this sort of period period in and around here, 2022, 20, three, that kind of period. So they, they, they coincide with the uh, gold cycle? Well, the dollar low, the US dollar cycle low should be, uh, as you can see here, there's one there in 2008. 23. So let me just have a little look here. So 2016, when you get the high point in the US dollar, that should equate roughly to a Eight low years. point in uh, in precious metals. So okay. these points here, around about 2000, 2016, they equate to the low point in the precious metal cycle. So the highs on here equate to the lows in the US dollar in the precious metal cycle. The low point here is likely to occur, um, I suppose, let me just work this out. Well, the high, the high point should be around about 2028, 20, 2030. So that's where we should see the, the high point in um, 
in gold and silver and precious metals. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next few weeks and months, of course, with the US dollar. It's not behaving in the way that I perhaps would have expected it to. I would yeah, expected. I, I thought we were going to take out the January low too, yeah. um, Kevin, before the Fed acted. Uh, but, you know, uh, W.D. Gant said, if you don't learn how to change your mind, you won't have any change left. Uh, you know, that was, <laughs> that was convincing enough for me to not want to fade it yet. No, not yet. And eighty-eight twenty-five is the number to watch, of course, and uh, yeah. that's the that's the low point here. So it was eighty-nine twenty in January of this yeah. year that it couldn't even take out. No, um, at no. the beginning of the year. No. Okay. okay. So, so uh, I was, I was going to put the Bitcoin chart on, wasn't I? Just for a, a okay, quick, yeah, a, a quick look. In fact, it's probably. Yeah, okay. I'll, so I'll, you probably get uh, from a lot of people that follow you a lot of questions of what's better, uh, Bitcoin or gold or Bitcoin or silver. Um, what do you tell people? Both? Own them both? I, yeah, I, I'd always advise people to um, sort of kind of you know, have their investments spread across um, a number of markets. Um, but it's timing, isn't it? You know, you want to be kind of shifting your 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 weight of holding you know, you know these are like nfts your charts are so beautiful that maybe someone will buy your digital art digital <laughs> technical art for a couple million dollars would you would you sell one of your charts for a few million <laughs> are you kidding what's your uh, what's your wire number Anyway, not much, uh, not much I want to do for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what an NFT is. Anyway, so. <laughs> uh, this is this is the Bitcoin chart um, as I was posting it a little, a little while back, of course. And um, yeah. if I go back a little bit further um, prior to this action here, you'll see that um, we were charting on um, on the website here that um, there was a bearish um, arc topping formation for Bitcoin, this inverted arc. And we also had a bear flag here. So the warning flags were there, the warning signs were there. Um, and crossing down the, below the 100-day uh, the moving average was another yeah. warning sign and break, finally breaking that flag, this right. smallest channel. So I, I, I called it the line of death. Yeah. That line there. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, so, uh, so how the now, moment, Brown Co? Yeah. What are you thinking here? <laughs> at the moment, it looks like this. Um, so the, the bigger picture... Um, we've got three arcs so far on Bitcoin. We're on to the third, the third arc in Bitcoin's lifetime, um, okay. and they've they've all completed very nicely, reaching the targets and then pulling back into the next arc. Um, this is all cycle behavior, of course, that's um, dictating this. Um, so you can say two things about Bitcoin or from a charting point of view, using my charts anyway. Number one is that the price of Bitcoin has never ever been above this dotted line it's never ever been above the resistance line so that's that's a line in the sand the other thing you can say is that the price of bitcoin has never ever been below the uh, the arc so arc number two and the one that went before it arc number one the price has never been below it so where we're at at the moment is historic in terms of bitcoin because if we break down from here and we go down below thirty thousand and have a monthly close below thirty thousand then um, we're into new territory for Bitcoin. It's something it's never done before. Um, of course, this looks very much like a head and shoulders top. It's a wick off distribution pattern. That would, yeah, but that would measure zero. It's a $30,000 it yeah. formation. So if you, yeah. the breakdown at 30 would take it yeah. to zero. It potentially could. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. well, with, you know, the, <laughs> from a technical chart perspective, it could return back to where it came from. I mean, the, 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 with a lot of cryptocurrencies, and bearing in mind there are, what, 10,000 or so of them out there, um, yeah. in, in this kind of environment, it's a little bit like the dot-com bubble. You know, 90% right. of um, the startups... The altcoins. You know, they'll disappear. They'll just go yeah. off in a puff of smoke and they'll take everybody's investment with it. And there'll be a lot of people really, really hurt by this already and even more so in the near future. Um, we may get one more shot at it, technically from a chart perspective here. Um there is um, no reason, just from the chart point of view, not to expect it to complete and fulfill its charting destiny. But that would probably stagger a lot of people at this, at this point in time. I think the sentiment is so bearish that everybody is now expecting uh, Bitcoin to, to crumble away, Ethereum to fall below a thousand, you know, and yeah. for a lot of the cryptocurrencies to just, yeah. So the best way to follow you and your partner? 
Yeah, you want to show your web your website, Kevin? This is where we are. We're on northstarbadcharts.com, northstarbadcharts.com, and we're both on Twitter. You just um, search uh, North Star or search um, Bad Charts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. you know, Kevin, I, I really appreciate your work. And, you know, besides, uh, you know, some of the forecasts that you make, uh, I you could tell about uh, the effort and the care that you put into producing these. And I uh, want to thank you for your giving spirit to be here yeah. to uh, edify our community today, my trading warrior brother. That's great. Thank you, Dale. Good talking to you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, I, you know, uh, uh, my hope is that pips rain down on you and Patrick and all the people that work with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. All right. That's everyone, Kevin Wadsworth, and you can find him at North Star Charts along with Patrick Kareem at Bad Charts One. And these guys are good. They're a must follow. And that's a wrap, everyone. Uh, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Remember, don't just count your uh, cryptos, even though you, they're worthless, or your silver bars and Morgan doll, silver dollars. Count your blessings. Adios, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Everyone enjoyed you, Kevin. Adios. Thanks, Dale. Bye-bye. Take it easy, buddy.